uh, Robert Gates famously said some years ago, you know, we have a perfect track record predicting the next war. We've never been right. That's not quite <laughs> true. We, we, we're a little better than that, but we're still not very good at it. Hello, I'm Paul Johnson with The New Frontiers. Today, Professor Henry Thompson and I have a great guest, Colonel Mark Kansian. Now, Mark has been running a war game uh, with the idea of what happens in the event that China actually invades Taiwan. I think they've run over 24 different games today, and it's one of the few areas where you can actually gain a glimpse of how our military strategically begins to prepare in advance for what may happen. This is a fascinating show. You're going to hear us talk about what's taking place in Ukraine. You'll also hear us talk about uh, what is happening in Iran. But most of our attention is done to the, to the battleness ready of the United States with one of our greatest assets in this country, Mark, who is with CSIS, which is the Center for Strategic and International Studies. This group has a great staff of people who, as a think tank, have been thinking through these very complex issues. Now, I'm just an average optimistic American who believes that the United States is still a cause for good. But to be a cause for good, we're going to have to play a role in making certain that this country is prepared for the challenges that we're going to face. Now, if you like this topic and you want to watch the rest of it, push that subscribe button and let's go on with the show. Destiny. Destiny. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. Destiny. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Uh, well, Mark, first, I'd like to welcome you to the New Frontiers. Thank you very much for coming on. Thanks for having me on the show. All right. Now, Colonel Cancy and I, you know, uh, I'm here with Professor Henry Thompson. Uh, we're really excited to talk to you today. Certainly, the United States is maybe in one of the most precarious positions that it's been in a long time. I, I like to try to make it analogous to it's almost a mixture of the threat we face with the Soviet Union along with the threat that we faced with the Axis powers. We have three major powers today, certainly China and Russia with Iran being a third one. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, they are nuclear armed, and that creates an incredible amount of threats for the United States today and our ability to be prepared. There's maybe no one that I've listened to who knows more about America's battle readiness than, than you do. You ran an absolutely fascinating study, um, and it's one that's been released to the public, which is something that I haven't seen, but it was a war game between, or war game that kind of outlined what happened in the event that China uh, actually invaded Taiwan. So while I'd like to talk about maybe uh, uh, Ukraine and Israel a little later in the show, let's start with just talking about Taiwan and what happened in this war game. Would you explain the study to us in general? Sure, uh, and thanks for those uh, kind words. Yes, we did a major project looking at a conflict between the United States and China over Taiwan and we did three things that were a bit unusual. Uh, the first was that it was entirely unclassified. That's why you've been able to read the final report. And because it was unclassified, we were able to talk about our assumptions in great detail. We were able to talk about the uh, contributions of allies and our assumptions about US capabilities and uh, the Chinese. And people could uh, uh, see you know, what the basis for our results was. The Pentagon, of course, does many war games, uh, and p bits and pieces leak out, but they're all classified. Some of the material that leaks out is, frankly, self-serving. Uh, so the public is really quite anxious, quite, quite interested in getting uh, some detailed, unclassified information. So we were able to provide that. The second thing we did is that we based the results on weapons testing and historical experience. We tried to make the results as objective as possible. And the third thing we did is we ran the war game 25 times. Uh, many war games that are run in the think tanks are run once or twice, and those can be very interesting and educational for the people who are involved, but that's not really a strong foundation to build analysis and policy recommendations on because you're, you're running one scenario with one set of players and one set of strategies. So we ran 25 
iterations over about a dozen different uh, scenarios. And the bottom line was that in most scenarios, the United States and its partners could maintain an autonomous and democratic Taiwan, but it would come at very high cost. We lose dozens of ships, hundreds of aircraft, and thousands of personnel. The Taiwanese economy is wrecked, but it also inflicts great damage on the Chinese. They lose, uh, they take very high casualties in their armed forces, and enough that it might endanger the uh, future of the Chinese communist regime. That's uh, very interesting, Mark, if you'll allow me to ask a question. In what way do you foresee the in the war game, the Chinese regime being destabilized by the course of the conflict? We raised that as a possibility. We didn't investigate it in detail, but the main reason we did is uh, twofold. I mean, first, of course, the Chinese take a lot of casualties. They lose something like a hundred ships, uh, many dozens of aircraft. But the biggest thing is that when their invasion of Taiwan collapses, the Taiwanese will capture 20 or 30,000 Chinese. And the sight of 20 or 30 Chinese POWs marching down the streets of Taipei as prisoners uh, might be more than uh, the Chinese regime could withstand. Of course, you know, Chinese regimes uh, still have this aura of, you know, the, um, you know, the, um, um, you know set up by a divine um, um, order and you know such an obvious uh, defeat might destabilize them but as i say you know we, we left it right there we didn't uh, look at uh, uh, at the results in any more detail i'm interested in just this concept of how you run a war game is this something done on a computer with algorithms or is it something with big maps laid out in front of you where you're moving ships around uh, by sticks. How does that actually work? What's it physically look like when you run a war game? Uh, it's the latter. Uh, this is a physical war game. So there were three maps and we're still running it. There are two operational maps, one for the Chinese and one for the U.S. This covers the Western Pacific and then there's a ground map uh, that covers Taiwan. And there are about 800 counters. The uh, Both sides move their uh, aircraft and their ships. Um, and on the Taiwan map, of course, they move their ground forces. And then we have ta lookup tables uh, to decide the results of uh, combat. Uh, there's a video, a couple of videos online. The Wall Street Journal just did a very nice one. So if people want to see what it looks like, uh, they can uh, take a look at the videos. And what about the decision to make the results and even some of the documentation of how the war game runs to make it public? Why did you decide to make it public? And are you hoping to get a certain resonance with the general public or with policymakers from doing that? What was your goal in doing that? The goal was to make the results accessible to a very broad audience. And we've been fortunate that that has occurred. And that audience includes both the general public uh, and decision makers here in Washington, D.C. It has been uh, briefed to you know, highest levels in the Pentagon. Uh, we went over to Capitol Hill many times. Many of the staffers are uh, familiar with the work. Uh, and governments overseas, interestingly enough, have been very uh, interested also. Of course, the Taiwanese, uh, essentially everybody in the Taiwanese national security establishment uh, has uh, read the report. Uh, same in Japan. Uh, uh, my two colleagues went over to Japan and ran the game at one of their think tanks, the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. And the Japanese were very, very interested. They did a one hour TV special, for example, on the game. And the reason Japan was so interested is not just that this is a major war in the Western Pacific, which of course would make them interested in any case, but that the result of the game was that a decision of, of war and peace for Japan would end up being made in Washington and Beijing and not in Tokyo. And, and that finding uh, was both disturbing and uh, got their interest. But we know that it was briefed at the highest levels of the Chinese uh, government, for example. Uh, many European governments uh, called us and asked uh, for briefings. So it got a lot of international attention as well as uh, attention domestically.
Why does Japan end up playing such an important role in this process? Japan plays a hugely important role, which was something of a surprise. We, we knew that Japan would be very important. We hadn't appreciated just how important. And the reason is that the United States has a number of bases in Japan, particularly uh, uh, on Okinawa, the uh, Kadena Air Force Base. And those are the only bases where the U.S. can launch tactical aircraft from that can strike uh, Taiwan and in the waters around Taiwan at the Chinese fleet. The range of our fighter attack aircraft, F-35s, F-22s, F-15s, F-16s, is just too short to be based anywhere else. We can't fly out of Guam, for example. So if the United States doesn't have access to bases in Japan, all of the, those aircraft in which we've, we've invested huge amounts of money are essentially useless because they just can't get in the fight and the United States has to conduct the fight with submarines and bombers with long range missile. And both of those are very powerful tools, but we need the full set of tools uh, to take on China. So Japan turns out to be critically important there. Plus the fact that if the J Japanese get dragged into the war, which they usually do, they have powerful armed forces of their own that contribute importantly uh, to the uh, coalition capabilities. Do the results of this war game differ much from the results of other war games? You mentioned that quite a few of them are classified or they are only run once, they're not run the same way. But surely there's a kind of an aggregate inherited wisdom about how these war games pan out. Did your war game lead to really different conclusions to what people had found before? Um. I'm going to say yes and no, classic uh, think tank answer. Uh, <laughs> the, the yes is that if you read press reports about Pentagon war games, you know the, that is those bits and pieces that leak out about the results of the uh, games, you would think the United States gets crushed. Uh, the uh, uh, results that get you know, sort of leaked out are very pessimistic. Uh, there was a quote, for example, that the United States gets its ass handed to it uh, in a conflict with uh, China. So our expectation, I think most people's expectation, is that it would be um, uh, come out very badly for the United States. Uh, on the other hand, when we briefed the results you know, to the highest levels in the Pentagon, most people nodded and said, yeah, that's about what we would expect. You know, that's about what our war, war gaming shows. So. You know, that indicated to us that maybe what was leaking out was not reflective of the internal war gaming. And in fact, the guy who said the U.S. gets his ass handed to it played the game. <laughs> and he said, yep, yeah, this, this looks about right. So uh, a lot of people do ask, well, why is there, why does uh, the United States do relatively well? Uh, and uh, when the expectation is it would do so poorly. And one reason I we point out is that conquering Taiwan is very hard. Yeah. Amphibious operations are extremely difficult. They are uh, complicated because you have to build up combat power ashore from zero. And then the island itself is hard to conquer because the central part is very mountainous. The coastal strips have cities and rivers, so it's easy to defend. It's, it's a very difficult operation. And that's why the Chinese typically have such a hard time conquering the island. All right, so that leads to the question, obviously, what are the projected losses for the United States government? My understanding is that, that in most of the cases, we end up actually losing two of our, what is it, 12 uh, aircraft carriers? Well, that's right. Um, starting with the aircraft carriers, one problem the United States has is that uh, our longstanding policy and practice is that in a crisis, we will deploy forces forward in order to deter a conflict and to enhance war fighting if it comes to that. And that's been a very successful policy for a long time. We saw it in the Eastern Mediterranean in the uh, recent wars in the Middle East. The United States surges carriers and forces into the area. The problem with a conflict uh, against China is that their long range missiles are so numerous and so powerful, we have put all of these assets now inside the Chinese 
missile defensive zone. So when the war starts, and the war starts with a Chinese missile attack on US and Japanese forces, uh, those carriers are inside the uh, defensive bubble and the two carriers, one that's there permanently and one that's forward deployed, both get hit. Uh, they may not sink, uh, but they're at least damaged enough so they can't operate and they're probably so damaged that they uh, um, you know, are inoperable. So the United States loses two carriers, most of the carrier battle groups with them, uh, as well as uh, many aircraft on the ground. And this was another interesting uh, finding, that is that about 90% of US aircraft losses were on the ground to Chinese missiles, because periodically the Chinese would launch dozens of missiles against these air bases and destroy US uh, aircraft on the ground. So US losses in the, in the base case, I think, maybe 300, 350 aircraft, uh, about a dozen, 15 uh, ships, and maybe uh, 10,000 troops. And that's in three weeks. Remember that in 20 years of war, the United States had about 5,000 uh, KII in, in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. So to have comparable losses in three weeks would be uh, a shock, something the United States hasn't experienced really since uh, 1945. So Mark, is this kind of reminiscent of Pearl Harbor, where there's an initial attack by uh, China, which takes out a large number of American forces, very valuable military assets, just like the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor took out so many military assets. And then there's kind of a long protracted uh, struggle counteroffensive by the United States, but in this case, it's just much further west in the Pacific than it was during uh, during the Second World War. Well, the beginning does look a lot like the beginning of the Second World War. The uh, Most people don't realize that the US Navy moved the battle fleet from San Diego to Pearl Harbor in the spring of 1941 in order to enhance deterrence against the Japanese. And of course, we all know how that came out. And we see the same dynamic here in our war game. It's one of our findings and one of our recommendations to the Pentagon is find other ways to enhance deterrence that don't involve creating a, a target. There's a great quote by the strategist uh, Tom Schelling who says the problem with a strong deterrent is it also makes a great target. Uh, the course of the war is a little hard uh, to forecast. Now, we look at only three or four weeks. The war in the Pacific, of course, went on for um, what, nearly four years. Uh, we only looked at three or four weeks. We'd love to do a longer war game to see uh, what would happen. One of the things we started to see in uh, the fourth week was that both sides start running out of their preferred munitions and out of many platforms. So they were having to adjust their tactics to uh, a different set of circumstances, different set of weapons being available. Uh, we're hopeful that we're going to be able to have a chance to look at what you know what those dynamics are when you can't have uh, your preferred munitions, your preferred platforms, you can have to improvise. The kind of thing that we're seeing a lot in Ukraine. So you talk a lot, a lot about deterrence. What type of recommendations have come out so far for the United States and Taiwan uh, to try and help create a deterrence that maybe stops this in the first place? We make a, a variety of recommendations because we note that even though the United States and the coalition prevail, the cost is very high and it's worth therefore deterring the conflict or ending it more quickly if, uh, if, it, if it comes uh, to a conflict. Uh, we make about, I know, about a dozen uh, recommendations. For example, uh, we recommend that the uh, uh, U.S. Air Forces in the Pacific uh, build more hardened shelters and look more at dispersal. Now, the U.S. Air Force is doing a lot of work with dispersal. They have a concept called the Agile Combat Employment, where they would disperse aircraft to other uh, airfields that's uh, moving in the right direction. Uh, and we say, keep moving in that direction, expand your vision there. Uh, but they are not building any hardened shelters. There are no hardened shelters, for example, on Guam. So when the Chinese uh, attack with submunitions, the United States loses hundreds of aircraft. So we argue we need to build more uh, uh, hardened shelters. Uh, 
we, um, uh, one thing we recommend is that before the war, the United States uh, decide how, uh, what deployments it's going to make. In other words, if you've talked to uh, officers in the Marine Corps and in the Army, uh, they say, well, before the war begins, we expect that our troops will be on Taiwan. If you talk to people in the White House and, and State Department, they say there's absolutely no way we are going to send forces to Taiwan during a crisis because that will precipitate the war that we're trying to avoid. Uh, one of our recommendations is, you know, those are both defensible positions, but they are not consistent. And it'd be much better to have thresh that out now rather than to do it in the Situation Room when the fighting uh, has begun. Another uh, recommendation is about expectations. And uh, this applies mostly or, or most strongly to the Navy and the Air Force because they have operated in sanctuary ever since the end of the Second World War. Uh, the Air Force operates out of bases that are uh, fortified and essentially pretty safe. The Navy has been offshore where there hasn't been a, a Navy to oppose them. It's going to be very different in a great power conflict. Now, the leadership of both services understand that a great power conflict will be different, and they've said that many, many times. The problem is that the lived experience of the officer corps is regional conflicts, Iraq, Afghanistan, even the Balkans. And that's very different from what they're going to face. You know, the ships are going to get sunk. Aircraft uh, bases are going to get attacked. And getting people ready for that is going to take some effort. The example we use in the report and we've used many times around town is follow on forces that are arriving at Kadena Air Force Base on Okinawa. These uh, aircraft are going to land on a very bumpy runway because the Chinese have struck the uh, runway many times and it's been repaired. They're going to taxi past literally hundreds of wrecked aircraft that were caught on the ground. They're going to move into an empty barracks uh, because a squadron that came before them has been wiped out in the previous uh, uh, missile attacks. Uh, the hospital is full of wounded. The golf course has been turned into a cemetery. And they're going to be told, welcome to Okinawa. Tomorrow you fly over Taiwan. And the Air Force has not had experience like that since you know, maybe 1944, maybe 1943. Yeah, very reminiscent almost um, of the Battle of Britain. Uh, that description uh, made me think of the young cohorts of British fighter, fighter pilots coming into the, the bases in southeast England uh, during the height of the Battle of Britain. But uh, a lot of the things you mentioned about deterrence, Mark, really brought uh, Ukraine to mind. And I think Paul has more questions about similarities to Ukraine. Something that struck me was your our discussion of running out of munitions. This is something that's happening in Ukraine as we speak, that the Ukrainians are trying to substitute drones for uh, heavy artillery. But just as an um, initial question on the conflict, what lessons do you draw for your war game from the failure of American deterrence in Ukraine? The biggest thing is that stuff happens. Uh, we argue that uh, War conflict is not inevitable, but it is possible given Chinese rhetoric and its military buildup. And what we've seen in Ukraine is that wars happen, even though we might think as outside observers that going to war is not a rational act. Other countries, other leaders weigh circumstances differently from us. They may uh, misjudge the military balance. They may believe that uh, time is against them and they need to move now. Uh, they may be just insulated from getting a, a clear sense of uh, other countries' reactions. There's a great book that just come out uh, in the last, I know, a couple of months about Iraq and about Saddam Hussein, now that we have access to uh, much of the uh, archives there, uh, and making the point that you know, that uh, Saddam had all this information, you know, he was just not thinking the way we thought he should be thinking. And that could certainly uh, happen in the future. One of the 
uh, lessons we point to is the Japanese before World War II. Now, our analysts looked at Japan attacking the United States and said, you know, this does not make any sense. You know, we are just so much bigger. You know, they cannot win a war against the United States. And the Japanese agreed. You know, they knew that they were outclassed, but they felt that because of the American embargo against oil and the balance of power moving against them, that they needed to move now. So they made a very risky decision to attack Pearl Harbor, hoping that the United States would um, essentially give up after uh, six months. Uh, so they knew it was risky, but they did that anyway. And uh, so one of the, I think the big lessons we learn is that stuff happens and you have to be ready for events that you uh, are not expecting. Mark, I'd like to ask another question or two. I have a related question because stuff happens Absolutely, but the United States also tried pretty hard to deter Russia and thought they could deter Russia uh, back in early 2021 before the invasion of Ukraine. But it seems to me a couple of things jump out at me from that failed attempt. The first was this uh, widespread intelligence sharing by the Biden administration that they thought by uh, sharing a lot of details about Russian troop movements along the Ukrainian border that they would somehow uh, call the Russians bluff and say, listen, we know what you're up to and they therefore wouldn't invade. That failed. Uh, another thing that jumps out at me is there was some rhetorical uh, ambivalence on the part of the Biden administration. I would say in particular this uh, statement by President Biden about a limited incursion that would not uh, be punished as harshly in the case that it happened which I think was pretty destabilizing for the Americans' deterrence attempts. And the third major factor is their reliance on economic sanctions and the thought that economic sanctions would uh, be sufficient to punish the Russians to deter an attack. And um, that also seems to have been a complete miscalculation. So I'm wondering whether those are options that you sort of had on the table during your war game, but you subsequently took them off the table because they just were such uh, abject failures in the case of Ukraine, or, or just in general, what your uh, thoughts are on the on the failure of deterrence uh, by America and Ukraine. Yeah, let me talk particularly that first point about uh, intel, uh, because in our war game, you know, we start with the assumption that. Uh, the Chinese leadership has made a decision to attack. And you know, for a variety of possible reasons, but we're, we're taking, we take that as a starting point. So we don't engage on the question of uh, sanctions. Although what you say is absolutely true. You know, we thought that sanctions were going to be much more powerful and much more persuasive than they seem to have uh, turned out to be. You know, the question of intelligence is very interesting because uh, you know, in 2003, of course, it was tremendous intelligence failure about uh, WMD and Iraq. Uh, with Ukraine, intelligence was spot on. <laughs> you know, we, we could see what was happening. Uh, we, uh, the intelligence community got it right. Uh, but as you say, uh, despite the fact that the Biden administration was running around saying, you know, we see what you're doing, don't do it, uh, they did it anyway. Um, um, it's interesting because there had been a strategic theory before the war, uh, which was called deterrence uh, by, I think it was called, they called it information operations. Uh, you know, that is the idea that, you know, our intelligence and our uh, forward deployed forces would see what was going on. And by that, we, by that knowledge, we could force potential adversaries to, we could deter them, you know, uh, from doing whatever they were, going, they were going to do. And it was, you know, that idea got a lot of uh, attention. Uh, and of course, abject failure. And now you don't hear anything more about that. Okay, we've learned our lesson uh, on that one. Did it, Mark, did it rely on a kind of a shaming? The, 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 the actual mechanism was sort of shaming the, the adversary before uh, the act? Was it, that kind of the mechanism behind it? It wasn't, you know, I mean, shaming, you know, but it was uh, as much, you know, telling them that, you know, we knew what they were up to and then we would right. be able to react very quickly. Um, if we know what you're going to do, we can re respond more convincingly than if you think you're, right. you've got an information advantage. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and that turned out not to be true. Uh, you know, but then that's, you know, we learned, you know, it was a plausible theory. It just turned out to be wrong. All right. So my concern on this is, um, you know, I, I suspect there are a variety of different ways the United States could react. 
and, and part of that's going to be driven by American politics. Uh, certainly in the political realm, there's an isolationist movement that's going on inside the United States. Maybe that becomes stronger. But uh, I kind of believe what you said earlier is um, it's more analogous to what happened in World War II. There, there was an isolationist movement going on in the 1930s and the 1940s in the United States uh, with notables like Henry Ford being involved with them as well as uh, Charles Lindbergh. Once we saw our ships light up, in Pearl Harbor, that changed the entire, entire American psyche, and we didn't go away, we went towards it. What I'm wondering about is, how do you deal with nuclear deterrence on this? Is there any, is there any importance of making certain that we don't jump the gun on that, or that they don't jump the gun? Is there, are there plans that are being laid out to make certain that that becomes part of the discussion? Well, that's a great question. Uh, two issues came up. Uh, in the playing of the war game. And as I said, we, we played it 25 times, so there were probably you know, 50, 60 uh, participants who had uh, participated. And one of the issues that they raised was nuclear. The other one was about blockades. Many of them thought that a blockade would be a more likely, potentially more effective uh, way for China to um, act. And we didn't disagree. We, we said, you know, those are both plausible, but for this war game, we're going to focus on invasion, and we're going to make the assumption that it is entirely conventional. That could happen. Bringing in nuclear uh, is an you know, additional uh, dimension that that war game wasn't prepared to incorporate. Now, we have a, two follow-on efforts. One is looking at nuclear operations, and one is looking at blockade. So in a year from now, you know, we can have this conversation again and discuss the uh, results of those two efforts. I can't say that on nuclear, the, the dangerous moment, uh, we, we've run a couple of uh, iterations of the game, we're gonna do, I think, 15 in total. Uh, the dangerous moment is when the Chinese realize that they are losing, particularly as their forces start to lose on Taiwan and they're having to retreat back to the bridgehead because uh, you know, they can see what's going to happen. And either you take the 30,000 uh, prisoners and accept what that might do to your regime, or you use nuclear weapons, because by that time, uh, they don't have the, um, uh, you know, the air power and, uh, that they did in the beginning, and they're running out of missiles. Just have a follow up on that, uh, Mark, you know, we have been discussing a lot the probability of a Russian nuclear use in Ukraine. And there's been some interesting revelations for many people about Russian nuclear policy, which is they have this so-called uh, escalate to de-escalate policy, whereby if the quote unquote integrity of the Russian state is threatened by a foreign adversary, they are comfortable to use nuclear weapons uh, on the battlefield in order to sort of, I guess, escalate to de-escalate, meaning that you escalate massively through the use of nuclear weapons and that kind of ends the conflict, um, which is an interesting uh, concept because, of course, everyone thinks that nuclear escalation leads to more escalation. What are the Chinese tactical guidelines around the use or non-use of nuclear weapons in a... Um, on, on the battlefield, do they have similar guidelines to the Russians that we know about, or is it all too secret, or is it less clear cut? Um, well, first, of course, we, we don't really have a lot of insight into uh, Chinese uh, doctrine. But one thing we can see is that their approach to nuclear weapons is very different from the Russians. Uh, the Russians had built a wide variety of nuclear capabilities, strategic, but a lot of tactical nuclear capabilities, and they had done that from the, the very beginning. The Chinese have not done that. Uh, for a long time, the Chinese had a relatively small number of uh, ICBMs, nuclear uh, missiles, mm -hmm. that were intended as counter value. You know, in other words, they were going to strike an adversary's homeland, and they were intending to deter uh, by the pain that they could inflict. They were not planning to use them on a, a, a battlefield. For a long time, those were probably more directed at the Soviet Union than at the United States, I presume. <laughs> well, uh, and that may well be true, but uh, uh, 
now they're expanding their nuclear capabilities. Of course, they're building more ICBMs. My understanding is that they are not building tactical nuclear weapons, but they are at the point where they could do that. And in our game, we use their strategic nuclear weapons in a, in a tactical way uh, 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 or in a non-strategic way. I mean, I'm always a little reluctant to, to use those phrases because, you know, for us, it's a tactical use of nuclear weapons. You know, for the Taiwanese, it's strategic. I mean, their cities are getting incinerated. Absolutely right. It's a very small island. A nuclear attack on any part of Taiwan, considering the population density, would be absolutely horrendous. Uh, it is. And, you know, we've done calculations uh, on that. And one of the problems, again, just judging from the first couple of games we've done is, you know, the Chinese player figures, all right, if I'm going to use nuclear weapons, I'm going to use a number of them. You know, there's no point in just using one uh, to get a battlefield advantage. So, uh, you know, they use three, four, five, 300 kiloton uh, weapons. And, you know, that does tremendous damage to the Taiwanese army, but also uh, to many civilians. I'm going to pack a couple of questions into one because they're related. Um, again, it seems as though we have at least three spheres of war, uh, or more certainly spheres of influence, the Chinese uh, in Asia, Russia in Europe, as well as Iran in uh, the Middle East. I'm, I'm interested in how those conflict with one another, whether or not we actually have the ability to be able to deal with all three at once. Um, where do they complement one another? Are there are there areas where maybe one is a land invasion and the other is uh, is dealing with a, a naval battle? Uh, and then the last question that I would just ask uh, in relationship to that is, um, do, do you see that the United States actually, um, what additional work do we need to do to be able to make certain that we get a lot of complaints about our industrial military complex, but this is one of those times where I think we ought to be thanking them as opposed to criticizing them. What are the things that we need to be doing inside that complex to make certain that we are prepared? Well, let me start with that second question first, because the experience in Ukraine and the insights from our war game and others regarding conflict in the Western Pacific is that we just don't have enough munitions. I think this came up a little earlier in our conversation. Uh, some of our uh, long range precision munitions run out in the first couple of days uh, of the war. Now that doesn't mean we don't have anything uh, to use, but it does mean that aircraft have to get in much closer. That means you take much higher casualties. Uh, what we've seen in Ukraine is that long wars take a lot of munitions and uh, weapons to fight them. And you need not just uh, what's available at the beginning of the war, but you need the ability to surge and sustain uh, wartime effort. And of course, this is something that every country in war uh, experiences as you know, you get past the first uh, couple, couple of months. Uh, our problem was that the industrial base, the defense industrial base was sized to produce efficiently at peacetime production rates. We had squeezed all the surge capability out because many people saw it as wasteful. And after the end of the Cold War, we downsized tremendously from you know, the very large industrial base that we had during that time uh, to what was much smaller. We encouraged uh, firms to merge together. So we got the industrial base that made a lot of sense for the quarter century after the Cold War regional conflicts, counterinsurgency. The problem is that for a long war, for an extremely intense war, it's not adequate, can't produce the uh, amount of munitions and equipment that you need. So we're going to have to uh, build into the system some surge capacity. I say to some people that looks like waste, but that gives you the ability to increase production rapidly when you need to, to do that. Uh, and there are some other mechanisms that uh, DOD and Congress have got together uh, to implement multi-year procurement, for example, being a, a major one. That, and that is, industry used to say when we talked to them, uh, you know, we, we would love to be able to increase production capacity, and, but 
unless we have the orders, you know, we just can't take that risk. And the way you convince us that the risk is worthwhile is you give us a multi-year contract. So then we will put the money in upfront to expand facilities because industry's concern was that they would expand facilities, the war would end after a year, the Department of Defense would cancel all of its orders and industry would be stuck with these uh, unneeded facilities. So Congress and, and the DOD have uh, instituted a number of uh, multi-year uh, contracts. You know, that's certainly a step in the right direction. On your first question about, you know, uh, uh, you know how these different conflicts might come together, uh, the U.S. Is, uh, you know, has forces a military establishment that can only deal with one great power conflict against China, for example. And if we did that, you know, the current strategy says that we will work to deter a second conflict. No, they don't say what that means, but we don't have much forces uh, available to do that. The uh, uh, it's uh, so the forces are not designed to fight. China and Russia, for example. Uh, now, with Russia, it's a little, you know, because we have NATO, you know, we could rely maybe mostly on our NATO allies to uh, hold Russia. You know, our problem with our NATO allies is that, you know, although they have quite significant military forces, you know, without US leadership, they tend to just mill about. Uh, a, a conflict of China and North Korea which is conceivable would be a huge problem. Uh, now, the only thing that would help a little is that Korea would be mostly a ground fight, whereas China is mostly an air and maritime fight still. You know, that would put you know, immense um, strain on US uh, resources. So basically, you know, we're, we're, a, we're a one war or one major war uh, 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 military establishment. Is there a possibility of changing that? And if we were gonna change it, what would it take? Should we change it? I, I think it's. Uh, I think we're going to. It's going to be very hard just to keep up with China. Frankly, you know, I think that you know, the American people have decided not to make the investment you would need to be a two-conflict uh, country, as we would have been in the past. If you look at uh, the burden on the economy, you know, the percentage of GDP that we uh, allocate to defense. Today, it's, it's a little over 3%, 3.1, 3.2, depending on how you count. Uh, you know, during the Cold War, it was running at about 6%. During the 1950s, it was running about 8%. So you know, if we were willing to put that kind of effort in, yes, then we could build a military establishment that could take on both China and Russia. Um, but you know, I think as a nation, we've de decided not to do, uh, not to do that. So do you mind hitting each one of the militaries and telling us, you know, in the Navy, is it more important for us to have submarines than, uh, than aircraft carriers? And in, in, uh, in the military or in the Army, is it more important for long-term missiles than it is for troops? Give us maybe some ideas of where it is that you think we should be shifting those balances. This is a very tough question. And the reason it's such a tough question is, uh, you tell me where the next conflict is, and I'll tell you what the right force structure is for that conflict. Uh, you know, uh, Robert Gates famously said some years ago, you know, we have a perfect track record predicting the next war. We've never been right. That's not quite <laughs> true. We, we, we're a little better than that, but we're still not very good at it. So uh, when you think about the future, there are people who argue we should focus all our attention on China because it is what's called the pacing threat. That is, it's the most... Uh, dangerous for the long term because of the strength of their uh, economy. And to do that, you would build basically an air and maritime force. The Army would contribute you know, substantially to air and missile defense, but you wouldn't have a lot of need for uh, ground forces like you know, tank units, for example. Uh, on the other hand, if you're going to fight in North Korea, you need ground forces, air and naval, much less important. Europe, you need a, a balance although like principally ground and air, naval, maybe much less so, Middle East, um, you know, probably air and missile defense, you know, with maybe some counterinsurgency. So, you know, depending on which war you're going to fight, you need a different set of forces. And then you've got the demands of day-to-day -day, uh, employment. We have forces that are forward deployed for crisis response. And, you know, that's a different 
need than you might need for uh, war fighting against China. For example, submarines and aircraft carriers. Aircraft carriers are hugely valuable for regional conflicts and for forward presence. And we've seen that with Ukraine, or not rather with um, uh, Israel and, and Hamas, the Gaza. When the war breaks out, the United States surges two carriers into the region along with a lot of other surface ships. Uh, in the Western Pacific, you know, uh, surging carriers, as we talked about earlier in the show, very dangerous because of the Chinese missile threat. So war with China, carriers, maybe not so useful. Day-to-day -day regional conflicts, very useful. Submarines are the opposite, useless against you know Israel and Hamas, uh, and not very good for deterrence because you can't see them. You know, on the other hand, against China, they are hugely valuable in our war game. You put uh, submarines into the Taiwan Straits, Straits, and they just chew up the Chinese Navy. We call it the happy time for U.S. submarines. So, um, Mark, I guess. I can ask a big picture question, which is after running this war game and seeing that it's very costly for both sides, but more costly for the Chinese than for the United States, and they don't achieve the goal, which I think it's worth noting Xi Jinping has stated quite openly that uh, reintegrating Taiwan into China is one of his major political goals. Given that that's the result and for your war game, do you therefore conclude that a Chinese assault on Taiwan is in fact less likely than you thought before. And then as a follow on, what sort of modernizations of the Chinese military would make you really nervous that they were adapting in a way that would make the conflict in fact more likely? Well, we certainly hope that Chinese have taken our results to heart and therefore that a conflict becomes less likely. We know that they have read the report. We know that it's been briefed at the highest levels uh, and the Chinese government. Now, whether they believe it, uh, you know, we certainly hope they do. Uh, in terms of things that they might do that would make us nervous, uh, you know, one, of course, is tactical nuclear weapons. And we talked about that a little earlier. Chinese have not had those, the Russians have, and building them would indicate uh, you know, the potential of actually using them in a, a conflict. The other thing actually that it would really help the, the Chinese in their uh, uh, conflict against the United States is long range uh, anti-air missiles. Uh, you know, if, if they can get at the US bombers from a long distance, you know, that makes life much, much harder for us. Mark, um, first, again, uh, this has really been an amazing report. I've definitely been interested in, uh, in just about everything that you had to say. Um, it, it, a question from my standpoint, you're obviously not just somebody who works in the space, you're an American. As an American, the two questions that I'm going to ask you are, number one, um, if you were in Congress today and you could push them in any direction, what are the two or three things that you would say are the single most important things that they should be doing? both in this conflict as well as in Ukraine or Israel, and you're allowed to go beyond three if you would like. And the second question that I would ask you is, how optimistic are you for the United States? On the first thing, what I would tell Congress is that if you want the strategy that the Biden administration has articulated, which is very similar to the Trump administration, which is very similar to uh, late Obama, then you're going to have to pay for it. In other words, you're going to have to provide the defense resources to implement that strategy. And when I say uh, the Biden administration's strategy, I'm saying you know, this is a strategy that is connected to allies and partners, that has strong forward presence for crisis response and deterrence, that um, modernizes nuclear forces, that maintains an all-volunteer force uh, uh, and compensates you know, service members uh, so that uh, the military can compete uh, in the civilian uh, uh, economy and that has a force that has global capabilities. And we're seeing that, for example, uh, 
uh, right now in Gaza. You know, the United States is going to build a temporary harbor 6,000 miles away. The United States is the only country in the world that could do that. And we can do it because we have this military establishment. Uh, it wasn't designed to do you know, uh, a, a temporary port in Gaza, but because we have these capabilities, we, we can do that. Uh, there are other strategies that the United States could adopt that are less expensive. You know, we could, for example, tell the Europeans, uh, you guys are rich, you guys have large armed forces, and you guys should defend Europe. And that includes deterring Russia. You know, we'll, we'll still be part of NATO and we'll back you up, but you guys have to take uh, the primary role. Um, uh, we could, you know, tell the same thing to our um, uh, Eastern allies. You know, we could tell the, uh, you know, the Taiwanese, you know, you know, being part of China is not that bad. Um, but we have decided not to do that. And because we've, decided, we've got to put the money in there. So, you know, notions about, you know, we're going to, you know, cut the fence. We're going to, uh, it's maybe part of some uh, <clears throat> broader discretionary cut. I'd say that's fine. Change the strategy to fit the dollars then. The other thing I would say is Ukraine is a great deal for the United States. Uh, and the reason I say it's a great deal is, you know, the Ukrainians are weakening one of our primary global competitors, that is Russia. And they're doing it without any U.S. forces on the ground. Uh, all they want is the equipment to fight the war. Uh, and uh, Russia is becoming much weaker as a result. This is a great deal for the United, for the United States, given that uh, um, you know the long-term tensions uh, with uh, Russia. Plus, you know, Russia. Plus, we're making a point that countries just can't invade other countries because they want to grab their uh, territory. You know, that would be very destabilizing. And if the United States does not continue to provide aid to Ukraine or in support of the war. You know, we're going to have another one of these humiliating retreats, like as we saw in Afghanistan. And if we have two such retreats in a decade, how many countries around the world are going to look at us and say, hey, you know, you can count on the United States to be there when the chips are down? No, the other kind of figure is that, you know, when the going gets tough, the Americans are going to bail out. Uh, so, you know, we should make whatever deal we can with, you know, our neighbors. So for a variety of reasons, it's a great idea. One thing I do want to add about the so-called aid to Ukraine, uh, it's really a misnomer because about 60% of all of that aid is spent in the United States, about 90% of the military aid is spent in the United States. And some fair amount of, uh, of it goes to support US forces is uh, in the 60 billion that uh, is now in front of Congress, something like 6 billion of that pays for US forces in Europe that we surged as a result of the war. Those are still gonna be there, regardless of whether this additional money uh, comes forward. And as a result, you know, the army, if it doesn't get extra money, is just gonna have to cut other programs. And the same is true in the Eastern Mediterranean. I think it's about $4 billion to cover the extra costs of uh, support to Israel and to international shipping. Uh, and if that is not provided, then they're just going to have to, have to cut back on other uh, programs. So it's not just the Ukrainians, it's U.S. Uh, forces also. All right. So last question I'm going to give you. Um, again, I, I, I feel very fortunate not only to have you on the show, but to have you working uh, in the Institute, uh, helping our United States government, uh, trying to make certain that we are prepared. That study, uh, I, we should be doing more of those in my, in my opinion. Uh, not only are they helpful in making certain that our enemies know what their risks are, I think they are helpful in letting Americans know what our risks are. And there are risks on both sides. Um, overall, in the time that you spent with the Institute, I know you also uh, went to the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, I spent some time there. I'm not sure what year you were there. But do you leave all of this more or less optimistic about the United States? Well, it's easy to be pessimistic about the United States. You know, we have great domestic tensions, and of course, we have a very dangerous uh, global environment. But the story I tell younger people is twofold. Uh, the first one is that when they say this is a terribly dangerous time, you know, it's it's a horrible time, you know, to be a young person. I say, 
really? You should have been around in the Cold War, you know, when there were <laughs> 60,000 nuclear weapons aimed at each other. Uh, we're far from that. And what do you think it was like to graduate from college in 1942 with a world war going on, or 1862 you know, with a civil war going on? So that doesn't mean that it's not a dangerous time, but it does mean that we should not fall into the era of what's called presentism, that is assuming that you know, the present time is unique and uh, dangerous. The other story I tell them is <clears throat> to take the long view. When I was young and studying mathematics, most of my professors uh, had studied German because they said when they were studying, when they were getting their doctorates, all the best work was in German. This was in the 1930s. Well, of course, what happened to Germany? Uh, you know, the Thousand Year Reich uh, was destroyed. And then later, when I was in college, uh, it was the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union had purportedly discovered, you know, this new uh, way of organizing an economy. You know, there was a command economy. They squeezed out all the inefficiency of capitalism, and you know, if you if you took your um, lines just right, you know, and you and you adjusted them, you know, you could have the Soviet Union overtaking the United States in 1984. Uh, and of course, where is the Soviet Union now? You know, it's on the ash heap of history. <clears throat> and then in 1980s, it was the Japanese. You know, the Japanese had discovered, you know, just in time uh, manufacturing. Uh, they were uh, an economic powerhouse. You know, they were uh, books about how the Japanese were no longer content to be number two. Uh, and uh, where are the Japanese now? You know, they're in the second decade of their, uh, you know, their uh, stagnant economy. So now it's the Chinese. And the Chinese, powerful economy, uh, they really have done wonders. Uh, but uh, this is a marathon, and you know, given the uh, U.S. track record, you know, I I wouldn't bet against us. Yeah, I agree with that, and you know, I, I think uh, being optimistic doesn't mean that you overlook the challenges that we have. In fact, I think one of the reasons we can be optimistic is because there are groups out there who are pessimists, who are constantly looking at what we need to do to improve. Those things end up being symbiotic. Uh, Colonel Kensian, thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you for all that you're doing. And if we can ever be of help, let us know. That was great. Thank you. Mark, it was great to meet you. Well, thanks so much for having me on the show. I, I've enjoyed our time, and I hope it's interesting for your listeners. Gentlemen, thank you. Well, again, I'd like to thank Colonel Mark Kensian uh, for that great report, as well as my partner, Professor Henry Thompson. If you like what it is that we're doing, push that subscribe button. Make certain that you stay optimistic, and thanks for being with us here on The New Frontiers. And we stand today on the edge of a new frontier, the frontier of unknown opportunities and peril. It holds out the promise of more sacrifice instead of more security. The new frontier is here. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness.